writer and one of the directors of Paranorman. We can't wait for you to experience the movie on the big screen again as part of Leica's yeah. 15th anniversary. It's been almost 10 years since Paranorman originally premiered in theaters. And we're honored that you're here to celebrate the boundaries. Nine years. Oh yeah. Paranorman. I'm so old. <laughs> with me for a long time. In fact, I was writing it on and off for probably 20 years. There were elements of the story that speak to my childhood, that speak to me growing up as a kid who didn't quite fit in. Norman's relationship with his grandma, that was me and my nana. I'm sure if they just found her to sit down and talk it through, it'd be a different story. Not that she came back as a ghost to visit me, but uh, there's certainly some truth in those relationships. There's an incredible scene in the film where Norman's having one of his uh, yeah, this flashbacks, is right here. and the audience sees this understood agony. You can't do this! And the cool thing is that we shot this powerful scene with practical effects with all of our departments contributing across the studio. It's a thing of beauty, both on the screen and metaphorically, just like the movie. And just like Leica, we did our very best work as we collaborated in unusual ways together to bring her to life. And I think with Paranorman, we were like, how far can we really push this? Can we have this movie take place over an entire town? Can we have a cast of hundreds, if not thousands? In many ways, that had never really been done before in stop motion. The movie that was in my head, it wasn't just about making that. It was about using this immensely talented group of craftspeople and artists to make that better. And that's, I think, what we achieved with Paranormal. Be sure to stick around after the show for an exclusive behind the scenes tour of Leica Studios. Who's that guy? To watch even more bonus features, melodies. check out the new oh, okay. Leica Studios edition of Paranormal, out now on Blu-ray and DVD. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy Paranormal. Details, you know, why, why would you make something so detailed? Well, you know, how do you how do you create a world? And the beautiful thing about stuff frame is you can really give it a lot of texture and detail. If you do a regular film, you have a prop house and you fill fill rooms with desks and lamps and things like that. We we can't do that, so we have to consider each single thing. You can make anything in stuff frame, so you know why make it straight? You know, basically, we wanted the the, the film to be kind of realistic in tone, but very stylized. So, this sort of nervous, hand-drawn, like illustrated kind of look was something I, I was really excited about. And very hard to do, it's, it's not the kind of thing a set shop loves getting, it's a set of plans where there's no straight lines, because the tools only make straight lines, but we, we did find a way to work that out. It's actually quite subtle at times, and I think when you watch the film, the hope is, but you won't you won't overtly notice it. You won't be like, wow, everything's wacky and crazy. Um, it's pushed back a little bit, but it's enough to give it a signature, unique feel. That's the sort of what gets me to come to work is is trying to find new cool things. Like and to, to work in an environment like this that supports that is it's pretty amazing. <laughs> We start off with a 2D image of a, of a character. And my job is to turn that 2D image into a three-dimensional puppet, which can animate, can perform to how the director wants it to perform, can talk, can walk, can run, can emote. Okay, so either it's a human character, so they want it to move in a human kind of way, or it's a human character, but actually it's a ghost. So it doesn't move in a human way, because we have to then plan out how we're going to make that puppet move. We will make an armature, which is a skeleton, but we created metal, in metal parts, ball and socket joints, and sort of tiny engineered pieces, which is what allows the animator to pose the puppet frame by frame. It, 
there's a realism which definitely has been promoted with all of us. You know, we, I think that the style of Leica is a certain realism, but I think what we've managed to get with Paranorman is a designed realism. This project has been incredibly challenging for the puppet department because the shapes and the sizes of the puppets are so extreme. And one thing that we really wanted to overcome on this project was <laughs> big puppets, big characters, because it's really hard. You can't make an armature, a skeleton, sort of as big as a big square puppet. You really don't know until you get that puppet out of the mould and you start moving it as to whether it really, all the planning and all the discussions and all the ideas, whether they're all going to come, you know, whether they're all going to work. Um, so when it does, it's like, woohoo! <laughs> and when it doesn't, it's like, okay, we'll think a bit more about that one. <laughs> Rapid prototyping is a broad term that encompasses a lot of different types of technology and they're originally designed to come up with a very quick and relatively inexpensive way to go from an early computer design to a three-dimensional concept, hence the term rapid prototyping. They're actually creating in the computer each individual facial expression. They're digital sculptors in a way. They're sculpting these faces and not only are they sculpting them to look as beautiful faces, they're also sculpting the in-betweens to get from this to this face. On Coraline, we became the first company to use rapid prototyping to take an age-old technique of replacement animation. And replacement animation is a way of individually sculpting multiple different facial expressions. For Paranorman, we wanted to continue to make the forward march with the performance, but we really had to come up with a way to continue to make that same leap forward with the, the designs. So we look towards another type of rapid prototyping called uh, 3D printing, but it's color 3D printing. What color 3D printing affords you to do is suddenly build in the color into the model. By being able to have a more complex paint job and really being able to not sacrificing the character design has allowed us to, to push Paranorman in, the, in a world of its own. Performance has always been the Achilles heel of stop motion. These movies, like his movies, are very character driven. And if you don't connect with the character, then the story is sort of lost. With mechanical animation, which is another type that we use on Paranorman, a lot of the zombies are mechanical animation. You get beautiful, subtle animation, but you're limited to the expression that they were originally cast in. So replacement animation is, is always something that's the best of both worlds. And to be able to take an age old, one of the oldest forms of um, special effects, stop motion, and be able to redo it with modern day technology and uh, modern day designs and stories is unbelievable. It's a cool thing to be a part of. It's, it's actually very simple. You start, generally you start with a puppet that has a little metal skeleton inside, so you can pose it and it'll hold this position while you're moving it. And you effectively move it one frame at a time. You'll move it slightly, take a picture, move it a little bit more, take another picture. And when you knit enough of those individual pictures together, play them, it looks like the thing's moving. It looks like it has an inner life. But of course it doesn't. It's been brought to life by somebody. So it's a, it's a very simple process. You take something, you move it, you take a picture, you move it again. But to do it well is one of the hardest things to do. In a film like this, we're going for a very naturalistic animation style. We really, really want to get a sense that these are real characters. They really exist. They have a life within. You have to try to find nuanced bits. You have to find kind of subtle little things that give the sense that this, this is a real thing. This is a real living person. It's not a puppet. Someone's moving around. It really is about finding the, the, the key idea of the shot and then finding all those little things on the fringes, all those little extra bits which really make a performance sing. And when those things can come together, not only is it an effective kind of bit of storytelling, it's a magical moment of something being brought to life, which is you know, very fulfilling and very exciting to see. As you're working through it, you start figuring these things out. How does this character move? How can I get what I want out of this very small, limited little creature? How can I get a, a really strong emotional performance out of this thing? How can I make it feel real? So it, it is a process of just working through it, seeing what the limitations are of the puppet, and then pushing beyond it, really working with our puppet team, 
to make the best armatures on the planet, to make these things as expressive as a motor as they can be. Well, why, why would you do this in stop motion? The, the worst possible form of animation, the, the most difficult thing to do. Why would we do this? And we do it because we love it, because it has a charm and a warmth and a beauty that other things don't have. It is its own thing. And they can do many beautiful things with computers nowadays, and they do. They can do many wonderful things with hand drawn animation, and they do. Live action film is the same thing. The people who can actually do this at this level, with, in this form of, of uh, filming, is very small. But when they get the opportunity, they can produce wonderful things that you can't really produce in any other medium. And that's why we do it. Norman is shy, kind, different, a bit of an outcast. Norman starts the film as a very misunderstood young boy, and we see that in his body language. He's very closed in, his head is down, his body is slouched, his arms are very often close to his body, and he drags his heels. So does everyone come back as a ghost? No. My grandma told me it's usually people who still have stuff to figure out, or sometimes it's the ones who died suddenly or in a bad way. Norman is a child, so he's a fairly small puppet, and inside of his body he has an armature which is made up of a series of ball and socket joints that allow you to manipulate his limbs. In order to create a realistic performance, the puppet needs to be able to perform subtle and intricate movements. Norman is a great example of that. His costume is fairly simple, but his hoodie required a few tweaks just to make it animatable. So we put wire in the hood itself and around the base which allowed us to just gently manipulate those parts of it to make it look like it had some weight to it, it had some gravity to it. One of his defining characteristics is a shock of hair that sits bolt upright from his head and it stays that way for most of the film. During the climax of the film, which was a very energetic and windy action scene, we used what is called a stunt wig, which had wires built into it that allowed us to sculpt and manipulate each strand of hair frame by frame, which is much more time consuming, but needed to showcase that force and echo the energy of that sequence. As Norman gains confidence, his body language changes and his posture changes, so he becomes much more upright, growing as a character. At the end of the film, Norman faces his fears and makes peace with the special gift that he has and becomes a much braver version of himself. Courtney, Norman's older sister, you could say that she's a little self-absorbed, maybe a little superficial. She can be a little mean to Norman. I just went on lamp patrol. Tonight's gonna be a total yawn. Ah! Norman! To try to embody those aspects of Courtney's personality, she'd kind of often have her arms folded, like everything was really annoying and boring just irritating to her. Physically as well, she's tall and great for doing contraposture where you bend one hip down and lower the shoulder to meet it so you kind of get a little sass going on with her. It's like R-I-double-P-E-D, like a seven pack at least. Ew, watch it. She has this really fun bouncy ponytail. There's lots of hair all attaching to one sort of core grip point at the base of the hair. Find that balance between simplifying and just not allowing things to become too cartoony. I'm super psyched. This is turning into the most fun night ever. In the end, it was lovely to see her run to her brother's defense. Underneath all that hard exterior, she really loves her little brother. I have cheered the uncheerable Norman, and I'm not letting you give up now. Neil is Norman's best friend. Well, at least he wants to be. He's really friendly and lovable, very loyal, and he just pretty much says what everyone's thinking. <laughs> Leave him alone! Don't make me grow this hummus! It's spicy! <laughs> he has a breathing mechanism in his belly, or a belly mover as we call it. His belly will go up and down. Then you can use the loose-fitting jacket itself and just slightly manipulate it out and in to give him the impression that he's actually breathing. I'm busy! 
to get a naturalistic Warburg meal, it was better to try and give him a more of a natural gait, but at the same time, put a little bit of a waddle in there so he would sort of swing from the hips as he was bringing his legs around. It was finding that balance, finding that sweet spot where you kind of sold his weight, but you weren't making that cartoony and drawing attention to that. Norman, wait up! I keep telling you, Neil. I, I like to be alone. So do I. Let's do it together. In the end, Neil becomes the ultimate friend. And who wouldn't love someone who's got a kitten on the lunchbox? <laughs> Mitch is Neil's older brother. He's a muscular jock kind of guy. He's a little oblivious. Do you use free weights? Because your deltoids are huge. I've never used deltoids in my life. I swear, you can test me. Kill me now. Mitch has these amazing proportions. He's got these doodly little legs and these huge shoulders. So making sure that his weight distribution was correct when you were animating him was slightly challenging. We wanted to still make it look completely naturalistic so that he didn't look like he was actually struggling within his own body, but finding that balance. <laughs> the way that he would hold himself with these huge arms, it was much better just to find a nice shape and pose with him and try and hold that with him rather than him move around too much. It was nicer just to kind of sort of keep it really simple, not draw sort of too much attention to his physicality because it was already there. I thought I was driving the van. No one told me I was going to have to do this other dumb stuff. Even though he has this jock kind of exterior stereotype look to him, he's actually just a big sweetheart. And he's got a cool van. <laughs> right, we're gonna get through this together. <laughs> Mr. Prendergast is Norman's grubby uncle. He's a bit odd, and he can see ghosts like Norman. Strange faces peering through the veil. Mr. P was awesome. He was a big brick of a character. Because of his size, Mr. Prendergast's armature needed to be tensioned tightly, so you really had to use a lot of strength when animating him. He walked everywhere with intention, and because he wasn't light on his feet, we developed his walk to be more of a stomp. <laughs> oh, show him, and that scary little fat kid. Doesn't he realize we're running out of... With a character the size of Mr. Prendergast, it was important to have elements of secondary animation. And we were able to achieve that with his hat, with his coat, and with the tassels on his pants. At Leica, we shoot replacement animations, so the faces are hard, but Mr. P had this big bushy beard, so we needed to come up with some sort of solution to allow his head to move naturally against that brick of a body. So what we came up with was a silicone piece the lower part of the beard was soft, so when it pressed against the costume, it wouldn't pop the face off. Midway through the film, Mr. Prendergast died, and we see him as a ghost. In order to achieve the ghost look, he had to be suspended in the air with a robust rig that allowed complete spherical range of motion. Other than being suspended in the air, there really wasn't much difference animating him as a ghost versus when he was alive. Oh, nuts. In a film full of ghosts and zombies, Mr. Prendergast's eccentric personality allowed the animation team to create a unique character in the world of Paranorman. The zombie judge is the head of the group of zombies who come to life and chase Norman through the town of Blythe Hollow during a dark and stormy night. The zombie judge has a mechanical head which allows for his facial expressions to be more sculpted and molded you need to be able to create unique expressions and we do this by manipulating the mechanical parts underneath the silicon face that really allow us to pull and stretch and contort the face in a way that is much more fitting with a zombie than it would be for a human, for example. Zombies are traditionally slow and laboriously moving characters. So parts of their body would fall behind, their legs would drag, their reactions would be slower.
The puppet of the zombie judge was incredibly tall because he is a an imposing and scary figure in the film. So you had to be cautious of his arm movements and leg movements. You don't want anything too broad because the size of the character would just overshadow everything else. So you kept his limbs very close to his body. The zombie judge's cloak is a very technically challenging aspect to the character because the cloth has to move in such a way as to be believable and to hold its position through extremes of motion. So utilizing all these technical aspects we're able to create a very unique zombie judge character and hopefully making a formidable villain for Norman. So then I guess 